Hi, I'm Richard Elliott. I'm professor and director of medical ethics and professionalism at the Mercer University School of Medicine. Uh, today we'd like to talk about end-of-life issues and uh, this lecture has been prepared for third-year students at the Mercer University School of Medicine and there's really four big questions that we're going to try to answer. Can patients refuse life-sustaining interventions? And these are the so-called right to die and right to privacy cases. What do we do when patients can no longer decide for themselves? And this will take us to the Patient Self-Determination Act and advanced directives. What should we do when we have an intervention available, but we think it is, it is of little or no benefit to the patient, but the patient's family insists that the treatment continue. This is the so-called futility of care. And finally, what should we do when patients ask for our help in doing something, perhaps prescribing something, that will help them die? Let's begin with a case that you might be familiar with, but I want you to imagine that you're the attending physician in this case. You've recently graduated as an internist. You're attending at a Catholic hospital, Sacred Heart Medical Center. A young woman's brought to the emergency room. She'd been found not breathing in her apartment by her roommates, was briefly resuscitated by paramedics. On admission, she's placed on a ventilator. Toxicology is positive for alcohol and diazepam. She remains in a state where she's unable to breathe and is not conscious. Some months later, her parents request that she be extubated. I want you to think about this for a minute. What should you do? You have a number of options available to you. You're going to want to determine her prognosis. Is it expected that she'll remain in a persistent vegetative state, that she will not be able to regain consciousness? You'll want to ask about advanced directives. Does she have a living will? Is there a durable power of attorney for health care naming anyone to make decisions on her behalf? If you're unfamiliar with the hospital policies, and as a recent graduate, you might well be, what are the relevant policies and procedures in such cases? You might consider asking for an ethics committee consultation. Perhaps they can help you decide whether or not it would be ethical to remove a ventilator from this patient. Well, let's assume that a neurology consultation has determined your patient to be in a persistent vegetative state and that the prognosis for recovery is very small. Perhaps the medical directors informed you that Sacred Heart as a Catholic hospital, a Catholic affiliated hospital, does not condone removal of ventilators unless patients are brain dead. And let's assume that after you tell the parents all of this information, they still insist that the patient be extubated. Well, what are you going to do now? You want to try to transfer the patient? Perhaps offer all the assistance you can, enlist the parent's help in finding another hospital that will accept her? That seems like a reasonable thing to do. What about telling the parents that the hospital will pick up the costs of care if the patient remains intubated? But if they insist on extubating the patient, perhaps through court action, they will have to bear the costs. Clearly, this is an unethical action. Any decision that must be made should be autonomous, either by the patient, now of course, in this case, she can't decide, but her decision makers, in deciding what she would have wanted had she been able to decide, must also be acting autonomously. And to try to coerce them through these financial incentives and disincentives is not ethical. Well, let's say that uh, an accepting hospital isn't found. 
so the parents feel stuck. They go to uh, go through the courts. They go to the state Supreme Court, which decides in favor of the parents' request and orders removal of the ventilator. Let's take a look at what sort of arguments might have been made in this case. The court ultimately decided in favor of the patient's right to privacy, based on the right to privacy. They decided that this fundamental right, which arose in a case we'll discuss in a minute, Griswold v. Connecticut, means that this patient, acting through her surrogates, her parents, has the right to decide what should be done with her own body, even if it means refusing life-sustaining treatment. And the ethical principle underlying the right to autonomy is, of course, the principle of uh, the right to privacy is patient autonomy. That every person of adult years and sound mind shall have the right to determine what should be done with his own body. That's the famous Schloendorf decision in 1914 and Justice Cardozo. Well, what, what, what were the arguments made on the other side? What did the uh, uh, court also have to consider? Well, in addition to the right to privacy and the principle of autonomy, the court would have had to weigh arguments from the hospital, which said, we're a Catholic hospital. We have to follow the uh, edicts of the church and church policies, and the church is against removing life-sustaining treatment. They would have had an amicus brief, a, uh, a uh, paper from the American Medical Association saying that to remove life-sustaining treatment would have been unprofessional, would have demeaned the profession. Essentially, the AMA was saying doctors are in the business of saving lives, not killing patients. And they would have had to consider an argument from the attending who, as a recent graduate, had witnessed a colleague, also a recent graduate, prosecuted criminally for murder for having done the same thing in another state. Yet the court rejected these arguments and ordered the tube removed. Well, what should you do now? Should you stop the ventilator immediately after notifying the parents so they could be at the bedside and could grieve uh, uh, during the ventilator removal and thereafter? Or should you wean the patient from the ventilator? Well, of course, in this case, what actually happened was the patient was weaned from the ventilator, even though there was no hope that the patient would regain consciousness. The patient, surprisingly, and surprised everyone a little bit, the patient survived another 10 years in a persistent vegetative state, succumbing eventually to an infection. You might wonder about that particular decision, but that's what was done, and that's what happened. So who is this patient? You probably recognize her from our first year lecture. This was uh, essentially the story of Karen Ann Quinlan. Again, who overdosed on or took a combination of alcohol and Valium, entered a persistent vegetative state. Uh, the case was heard uh, at the New Jersey Supreme Court who ruled in favor of the parents to remove the uh, ventilator And why is this case important? Well, this is the first of the so-called right to die cases. And uh, most of you would not re recall this, but those of us who were around at the time remember that there was tremendous national interest and national discussion around whether there even was a right to die, whether patients had the right to refuse life-sustaining treatment over the arguments of the hospital and their Catholic policies, or the arguments of the AMA that to remove a ventilator was unprofessional, and that, the, that there might even be criminal charges brought against the attending. It's hard to imagine that today, since this is done routinely. But at the time, this case stirred national interest in whether there was such a right, and if there was such a right, on what was it founded? And we're going to look at a couple of cases that will help us understand this a little bit better, how this evolved from a patient not being able to refuse life-sustaining treatment to where we are today. And the first of these cases, and one you might not be familiar with, 
but is, is very important, is Griswold v. Connecticut in 1965. And what happened there was there was a Planned Parenthood clinic in uh, New Haven, Connecticut that had been giving out advice and prescriptions for contraception. But Connecticut law prohibited this practice. The, the case was taken to the United States Supreme Court, and they found that there was a right to privacy that gave women the right to have access to birth control. Now, the right to privacy, as you again might recall, doesn't exist anywhere in the Constitution explicitly. There is no right to privacy like there's a uh, First Amendment right to freedom of assembly. But the Supreme Court found that there is a right to privacy found within the penumbra or shadow of the Constitution. That is, if you look at all the rights together, all the statements of the Constitution, they recognize that what the, what the patient's decision-making ability is should be autonomous and should be protected and that people do have a right even in extreme circumstances such as refusing life-sustaining treatment to make those decisions so that's the right to privacy now this right actually became better known in a subsequent case and that's Roe v. Wade in 1973 and Roe v. Wade, of course, we all know, was an abortion case. And it is said the states could not forbid abortion um, prior to the time when the fetus became viable. And it based that on the right to privacy, that again, women had a right to determine what should be done with their bodies. And then it was a year later that uh, Ms. Quinlan uh, uh, was admitted to the hospital so the right to privacy was on people's minds. The right for people to determine for themselves what should be done was on people's minds. And that's how the court ultimately decided this first of the so-called right to die cases. Now, there were a number of other cases over several years where uh, there were attempts to define the limits of this right to die. But the one that you should know next is that of Nancy Cruzan. So again, from first year lectures, you might recall was driving along a back road in Missouri uh, in 1983. It was stormy. Her car flipped over. She was ejected from the car, landed face down in a shallow puddle of water, was there for a number of minutes, anoxic, uh, when the uh, emergency medical services arrived. She was ultimately resuscitated. I believe she was on a ventilator briefly, but then she was able to be removed from the ventilator um, her life was sustained through the use of a feeding tube. And the right to die argument, argument became a little bit more subtle. It wasn't so much did a patient have a right to have the feeding tube removed, which is what the parents wanted. After several years, they said that Nancy would not have wanted to be kept alive in such condition through the use of a feeding tube. But the argument uh, made by those who were opposed to this decision was that uh, it was cruel to starve a patient. Removing a ventilator is one thing. Removing a feeding tube uh, is another. And it's a little bit hard for me to accept this argument because if you wanted to take that line of attack, you could say removing a ventilator is equivalent to suffocating a patient. Removing a feeding tube is starving them. Um, and I, I, I don't buy that. I think in both cases, um, removing a life-sustaining intervention if that's what the patient wants, um, is defensible on the grounds of uh, the medical principle of uh, autonomy. But the legal issue was a little bit tricky because when the case went to the Missouri Supreme Court, they said that the evidence presented by the parents, that those would have been Nancy's wishes, had to meet a burden of proof of clear and convincing evidence. I recall also that uh, in the law, there are three uh, standards for the burden of proof. Uh, in civil cases, it's usually a preponderance of evidence. That is, one side is, has slightly more evidence. The weight of evidence favors one side slightly more than the other. In criminal cases, the burden of proof is beyond a reasonable doubt, where 
has to be overwhelming. There is no reasonable doubt. But in some cases, including civil commitments and removal of these life-sustaining treatments, the burden of proof is clear and convincing evidence, which is like uh, roughly 75% of the evidence favors one side. And the Supreme Court said the parents' testimony about Nancy's wishes didn't meet that burden, and they refused to order the removal of the tube. Went to the United States Supreme Court. They said that it was not unconstitutional for Missouri to apply that burden of proof standard uh, to these uh, removal of life-sustaining treatment cases. And, uh, but they ordered the case reheard. When it was reheard, not only did Nancy's parents retestify about Nancy's wishes, but friends came and testified that they also believed uh, Nancy would not have wanted to have been kept alive that way. Um, the Supreme Court then, the Missouri Supreme Court then decided that the clear and convincing evidence standard had been met, ordered the tube removed, and Nancy died several weeks later. Now, why is this case important? Well, it established that it doesn't really matter whether it's a ventilator or a feeding tube, patients have the right to refuse treatment, even life-sustaining treatment. Equally important, perhaps more important, is that there had been uh, legislation introduced in Congress, I think by Senator Danforth, the Patient Self-Determination Act, that would have uh, related to advanced directives, making people's wishes known. Because the Nancy Cruzan case was also a case of some national prominence, it was the first of these right-to-die cases to reach the United States Supreme Court, there was a lot of attention, weight given to their decision that said that patients essentially have a right to determine, uh, to refuse life-sustaining treatment. Um, was, uh, uh, attention to, was given to this by members of Congress. And one of the justices, Sandra Day O'Connor, advocated for this right to make these decisions and for the passage of the Patient Self-Determination Act, which was passed in 1990, and that was the year that Nancy died. And what does this law say? Well, the provisions are on this slide. Essentially, the purpose of the law is to ask patients when they enter into healthcare organizations receiving Medicaid or Medicare, to ask whether they have an advanced directive. We're going to talk about that in just a second. If they don't have one, to advise them that uh, they can make one out while they're there in the hospital, and the hospital will assist them. And it provides for the, uh, requires the training, the education of healthcare staff to understand the nature and purpose of advanced directives and how to help patients make these decisions when they're no longer able to do so. Well, before we get exactly to what an advanced directive is, let's uh, talk just a bit about the case of Terry Schiavo. And the reason I'm doing that is not because there's any legal um, uh, precedent established in this case, but it's a case uh, many of you will be familiar with. I just want to review the facts because as physicians, you will be asked about this or similar cases and sort of a brief review of what can happen, and, uh, and this is almost the worst case legally. Terry Schiavo was born Terry Schindler. I mention that because you will hear reference to the Schindlers when you read about this, and that was, uh, these were Terry's parents. She married Michael Schiavo in 1984. They moved to St. Petersburg to be near her parents, she probably had bulimia, and as a result of which was probably hypokalemic. She had a seizure, then a cardiac arrest. She entered a coma, then a persistent vegetative state. Um, she was not on a ventilator, but she did have a feeding tube. There's very little doubt that her husband, Michael, uh, tried to take uh, the best care of her that he could. He was appointed guardian. He took nursing classes in order to be able to take better care of her. He took her to the University of California at San Francisco to explore the possibility of an experimental approach of implanting electrodes to see if she could be stimulated out of her persistent vegetative state. Uh, in 1991, there was a diagnosis of irreversible persistent vegetative state 
There was a malpractice award, and this is important for uh, what happened later. Uh, $750,000 of the award was to be used for her care. Now, this award led to a rift between Michael and Terry's parents, the Schindlers. And Michael, after several years, you can see in 1994, was beginning to think that um, uh, keeping Terry on a feeding tube wasn't the best idea. Uh, a guardian ad litem reviewed the situation. Michael interviewed, uh, entered a uh, DNR order for Terry. And in 1998, he finally filed a petition to discontinue her feeding tube. The parents objected. They questioned his motives. Uh, my understanding is that part of the questioning had to do with uh, maybe Michael uh, didn't want to use the money for Terry's care, but wanted the money for himself. You'll see in a second, I, I don't think this is true. Well, I won't review all of the legal proceedings. That would take a long time. It would be pointless here. But it is clear that there were many hearings held in a number of courts. Uh, the central issue was, what would Terry have wanted? And the burden of proof in Florida, as it is in most states, is that this had to be shown by clear and convincing evidence that Terry would not have wanted to have been kept alive through the use of a feeding tube with a prognosis uh, that was so dismal. There were many hearings on this. The feeding tube was removed uh, several times and replaced. Uh, the medical evidence showed no EEG activity. The CAT scan showed severe atrophy. The court ruled that the tube could be removed. It was upheld by an appellate court. The, the uh, Schindlers petitioned a number of times to block the removal of the tube. This became a political football. Uh, Florida passed so-called Terry's Law that would have blocked the removal of the tube. Um, that law was overturned as unconstitutional. You really can't pass a law for one individual. The United States Supreme Court was petitioned several times. They denied certiorari. That means they refused to hear the case. Uh, now, and I think it's interesting that at one point, Michael was offered a million bucks by an outside group if he would waive his rights um, to make these decisions. So I don't think he was simply looking for the money. He had a chance to make more money. The feeding tube was removed for the, for the third time. Supreme Court heard the case again. Or they didn't hear the case. They refused to grant cert. Um, and finally, the tube was removed and Terry died. There was no new law. It just became so controversial. Um, I think some bogus medical evidence was introduced uh, when a, when a so-called neurologist uh, testified that uh, Terry was responding to her environment when in fact, he, in fact these were just reflexive moves on Terry's part. Um, and it was a very, very painful situation um, for all of the parties who were involved at the time. I can certainly be sympathetic to the Schindlers too with, with grieving over their daughter, but it was clear to me that Michael had the right to act as... Uh, as her guardian uh, to make these decisions. And that leads us to what is an advanced directive. Um, Terry did not have a specific advanced directive, nor did Nancy Cruzan, nor did Karen Anklin. Under the Patient Self-Determination Act, um, healthcare organizations are required, at least those who are receiving Medicare and Medicaid, are required to ask about the existence of an advanced directive. And in Georgia, as in most places, an advanced directive really consists of two parts. The first part is a durable power of attorney for health care. And that means uh, designating someone to make medical decisions on our behalf when we become unable to make those decisions ourselves. The second part of an advanced directive is a living will where we can specify, and if you want to download in Georgia, the Georgia Advanced Care Directive, um, the uh, living will will have sections where you can refuse or accept uh, specific medical procedures, including uh, uh, ventilation, feeding tubes. You can make these decisions uh, 
put them in writing, and then whoever's acting uh, on your behalf, whoever has the durable power of attorney for health care authority, uses that document and other uh, statements that you've made, values that you hold, to make decisions based on what you would have wanted had you been able to make this decision yourself. So that's an advanced directive. It's important. You need to ask about them. Um, there's a number of problems with them these days, particularly that we don't always know what they are at the time that we need to know them. Sorry about flipping forward like that. Um, I want to turn now to what is in my mind kind of the flip side of the problem uh, that we've seen in the cases of Ms. Quinlan and Ms. Cruzan. In those cases, families wanted to remove life-sustaining treatment, ventilator for Karen Ann Quinlan, feeding tube for Nancy Cruzan. Families wanted those removed. Healthcare organizations didn't want to remove them. But another situation that has been uh, coming up more often now is if a healthcare organization, say an attending physician, wants, uh, wants to remove a particular uh, treatment and the family wants to continue that treatment, even though we believe that care is futile. So what we're going to talk about for a few minutes is what do you do if a family's requesting treatment that isn't of any benefit to the patient? Now, there are a number of definitions of what futile care actually means. I'm putting one up here that's based on uh, a number of articles in the literature. The medical care is futile if there's an unacceptable probability that an intervention will produce a result that the patient will not be able to appreciate. So you might be able to keep inflating the lungs, keep aerating the blood, but it doesn't make any difference to the patient because the patient lacks the capacity to appreciate the benefit. They might be in a persistent vegetative state or a coma. Or the intervention lacks effectiveness or efficacy. It's never going to restore the patient to any semblance of consciousness. Uh, the patient's not going to have the ability to interact with the environment in a meaningful way. Now, obviously a, a tricky little combination of words if there's unacceptable probability. What does that mean? What is an unacceptable probability of an intervention being beneficial to a patient? Well, many people think that that's uh, something roughly less than 1%. So many interventions might work for 10 or 20% of patients. We don't consider that futile. But if the probability of this doing any good for the patient is less than a percent, we begin to think of that as futile care. So what do you do when a family uh, has a patient, a family member is in the hospital, say, four years on a ventilator? We had a case like this. There's no reasonable probability that the patient is going to recover. They're in a persistent vegetative state. They're always going to require a ventilator, as near as we can tell. The family insists that they be maintained on the ventilator. And you might be having to divert patients from your unit, from your... Um, critical care unit or wherever you're maintaining the patient on a ventilator. Patients, uh, other patients who might need a ventilator are being diverted to other centers because your ventilators are folding. What do you do? Well, remember, always remember rule number one, that when you're faced with a so-called ethical or legal dilemma, be sure that you act as a doctor. Rule number one, you're a doctor. So know your medical facts, your medical situation, as, uh, as thoroughly as possible. So probably the best advice there is you think you've exhausted the possibilities. You think the patient, say, should be off a ventilator. Family thinks they should be on a ventilator. Get a consultation. Make sure you're right medically. Yeah, this is an irreversible persistent vegetative state. Yes, the likelihood for recovery or any other sort of meaningful intervention to improve the prognosis is nil. But be sure you know the facts. Be sure you talk with the family about what are their expectations. Do they really think that the patient, just a little more time, and the patient's going to get better? 
they know somebody who recovered after such and such a time and they think their family member might do that too. But be sure you understand what do they think is going to happen um, if, the, if the patient continues with that care. And then you want to approach them, and this should be done in the most empathic manner possible, realizing the pain the family is going through. But they, they need to understand what you understand medically about the patient, the consultations you've obtained, all the medical workup, the reasoning behind why you think this patient isn't going to get any better, even if they're on a ventilator for another four years. Do this gently, empathically. Give them time to absorb it. Do it a number of times if you have to, but give them some time to absorb this. If uh, you seem ineffective in getting through to the family, and sometimes we are. Sometimes we are because our communication skills need a little bit of work. Sometimes we're ineffective because families are mistrustful of hospitals. And they might tell us, oh, you, you just want to uh, save money, or you're just looking to um, get rid of her so you can put somebody in here with better insurance. Or, you know, people have various reasons to mistrust us. And they're not always wrong about that, but... It's good to think uh, uh, perhaps there might be a family member, a family pastor, hospital pastor, somebody else that can approach the patient with information to understand their views better and to present the information to them to help them understand why we think the way we do. An ethics committee consultation is highly recommended in cases where there's an impasse between families and uh, treatment teams. Um, they can act as more neutral mediators. They can educate us, physicians, on some of the ethical issues. Maybe we're wrong. Maybe there are situations where continuing this care is really in the best interest of the patient. I ran into one of those one time. Um, but maybe they can also help convince the family that we're crossing the Alps on bloodied knees, um, to trying to provide the best and most ethical care for this family member. Attempt to mediate. Now, it's not just one time, but we uh, continually attempt to mediate to help bridge the gap between family and physician uh, to see if there is some common understanding we can reach. Certainly, we want to give the, the family an opportunity to transfer the patient to another hospital, assuming this is a hospital, to a hospital that is uh, more likely to agree with their wishes. And we ought not to just tell them to go find a hospital. We ought to provide them with resources, help them as much as possible. It's a daunting task for patients to present this information. We ought to try to help them with this transfer. Medical directors of hospitals run into these situations far more than the average attending. They're more familiar with hospital policies. They have uh, more chance to consult with legal counsel, the ethics committee, and others to see if uh, uh, perhaps they might know one more bit of information that could help resolve this. Legal counsel, now legal counsel is sometimes part of the ethics committee, but certainly we ought to be aware if there are any laws um, that pertain to this situation about removing the uh, patient from uh, a life-sustaining intervention. Well, bottom line is there are some places that have policies and there's a, there are some states, including Texas, which permit physicians unilaterally to remove a patient from life-sustaining care. We ought to be very careful about this because of the damage it can do to patients. And we ought to make sure that uh, if we have a policy, if you look at the bottom of this slide, that it includes those things we just talked about. We don't want to rush into removing unilateral care. It might be a bad medical decision if we haven't obtained enough consultation. It's certainly a bad ethical decision if we don't respect the patient's family's wishes by understanding those wishes and seeing how we might work best with those wishes. And if we haven't made reasonable attempts to transfer the patient elsewhere. Many hospitals don't have such uh, policies, but it's a good idea to know if they have them. And uh, you certainly want to follow the policy if uh, you're a member of that medical staff. Well, 
Um, we're now going to turn to yet another situation, our last situation in these sort of difficult end of life decisions. Think about this for a minute. And I can guarantee you, most of you will run into something like this in your medical practices. 54 year old woman with terminal amyotrophic, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis approaches you with a request for something to ease me out. She'd like to say her goodbyes, but breathing's become so difficult she can't bear to live gasping much longer. I had a patient like this, and it was so difficult. Her, um, her weakness had uh, affected her ability for a valsalva maneuver. Her abdomen had filled with stool. It was impinging on her diaphragm. Her accessory uh, breathing muscles were impaired. Um, each breath was so painful, and she wanted something to ease her out. My own mother, um, at the end of her life, she had a uh, pharyngeal carcinoma. It was so painful to eat, to drink, um, that she, uh, she asked me to give her enough pain medicine to uh, help her die. You're going to face this with lots of patients. And it's a good idea to think about what you would do. Now, some states have a provision. Actually, only two states have this by statute and one state by a Supreme Court decision that permits something called physician-assisted suicide, which is essentially where physicians write a prescription for patients that uh, they can take and, uh, and die. Um, now, that's to be distinguished from euthanasia, which is where a physician administers the medication or does something that actually kills the patient. In all states, euthanasia is illegal and in most countries. But again, physician-assisted suicide is legal in several states. A referendum to legalize physician-assisted suicide was, was defeated in Massachusetts in 2012 by a very narrow 51 to 49 percent margin. Now in Oregon, it was passed in 1994 by that same margin, 51 to 49 percent, the Death with Dignity Act. We're going to get to what that is in just a second. There was a lot of opposition to this. There were numerous court hearings. Finally, the United States Supreme Court um, said that uh, uh, it was not unconstitutional, the Death with Dignity Act. The voters repassed the act by 60 to 40% in 1998. Now, what does the Death with Dignity Act in, do in Oregon do? Well, it requires that a patient requesting a lethal dose of medication under the act be competent. It requires that there be a prognosis determined for this patient of less than six months to live and that that prognosis be confirmed by a second physician. It requires a 15-day waiting period after the request, basically a cooling off period, and that the physician who writes the prescription for the medication does not administer the medication. Again, that would be euthanasia if the physician were to prescribe the medication. Now, I have to tell you, there are plenty of circumstances where um, Physicians or nurses administer medication. It happens all the time. It's been happening for very for thousands of years. Typical scenario is on a cancer ward with a patient with severe pain from metastatic uh, bone cancer, and uh, the patient uh, no longer wants to live. And a discussion is held for the patient and family that yes, there could be enough pain medication given to relieve the pain but that's likely to depress respiration and the patient might well succumb from the effects of the opiates. Um, and in many cases, uh, patients will say, you know, I'd be better off that way than going on like this. I can't bear this. I've lived all the life I want to live. I can't go on like this anymore. There is no quality of life for me. Please do that. Now, when a physician gives medication under those circumstances, there is the principle, the ethical principle of double effect, that the medication is being prescribed ostensibly to ease the bone pain. But in reality, everyone knows, patient and family, that at those doses, it's likely the medicine's going to kill the patient. So it's not being given to kill the patient. It's not technically euthanasia. 
but it's pretty darn close to it because um, it's a people know that that's what's likely to happen. So anyway, that's the ethical principle of double effect, prescribing a medication for easing pain, but knowing full well that it's likely to kill the patient. Well, what's happened with the Oregon Death with Dignity Act? Since 1997, there have been 1,050 prescriptions and 650 deaths. Uh, almost two-thirds of the patients who got prescriptions took the medication and died. In 2012, it was about the same pattern. About two-thirds of patients died from the medication. So not everybody who gets a prescription is going to use it. They're generally older patients, age 69 in 2012. No difference, male or female. About 75% of patients who get a prescription have cancer. Only two of the 77 patients who died had been referred to uh, psychiatry, either for competence evaluation or for um, treatment. And it's interesting that uh, 61 physicians wrote prescriptions. It's not just several physicians doing all of the writing of these lethal prescriptions, but um, on average it's only uh, one or two or three prescriptions per physician. And I put the reference on the slide. You can see the uh, most recent data um, on the uh, public.health.oregon.gov site. Well, the uh, Death with Dignity Act was challenged several times. The United States Supreme Court said there is no constitutional right to physician-assisted suicide and that laws banning physician-assisted suicide are not unconstitutional. There was an interesting attempt by uh, United States Attorney's Office uh, several years ago to block the Death with Dignity Act. Essentially what they were arguing was that physicians through the FDA get their DEA approval to prescribe uh, controlled substances for healing purposes. And they should not be allowed to use their DEA registration to prescribe drugs that will be used to kill patients. That's not the purpose for which this uh, uh, license was issued. Uh, the court rejected that argument. So at this time, the Death with Dignity Act in Oregon and a similar one in Washington are operational. And Montana has a ruling by the state Supreme Court that physicians um, could not be blocked from writing such prescriptions. Well, the last part of this presentation, I just want you to think about what does the AMA have to say about it? As you can see on this slide, that uh, uh, they define physician-assisted suicide as uh, a physician facilitating a patient's death by providing the necessary means and or information to enable the patient to perform the life-ending act. So even telling a patient how to do it, telling them what they should purchase or how they could use their existing medications um, could be considered physician suicide. They then go on to say, though, that it's understandable, though tragic, that some patients in extreme duress, such as those suffering from a terminal, painful, debilitating illness, may come to decide that death is preferable to life. However, and this is the crucial part of this, allowing physicians to participate in assisted suicide would cause more harm than good. Physician-assisted suicide is fundamentally incompatible with the physician's role as healer. Well, essentially what they're saying is doctors are around to relieve suffering they're not there to kill patients. That's, and I know I'm kind of oversimplifying it, but that's the idea, is they don't want physicians to get a reputation for um, uh, causing patients' deaths. So it's kind of a, the professional statue, uh, stature uh, issue that they're addressing. And then they go on to list a number of other things physicians can do besides considering physician-assisted suicide. Well, let's just review briefly what have we talked about in the presentation. There is a right to privacy, and that came from the Griswold v. Connecticut birth control case that says that patients have a legal right to determine what shall be done with their own bodies. That includes 
and this uh, principle developed through the Quinlan, Kuzan cases, been uh, reaffirmed in many other cases, a right to make decisions that result in the patient's death, to refuse ventilators, uh, dialysis, feeding tubes, all sorts of life-sustaining treatments. We talked briefly about advanced directives, what they are. They consist of a living will, which specifies uh, treatments which patients either want to have or don't want to have, and the uh, designation of uh, authority for durable power of attorney for health care to an individual who can make decisions based on the patient's wishes when the patient's no longer able to do so. We talked about futility of care. What do we do when families want us to continue a treatment which provides no benefit for a patient? And what steps we ought to consider as we attempt to mediate and resolve the difference between the health care team and the family. And the most important concept there is rule number one, be sure we know all of our medical facts before we tell families that, that this is the only treatment available and it's futile. And finally, we talked about the concept of physician-assisted suicide, which is to be distinguished from euthanasia. We talked about uh, how this has been implemented in Oregon and the results from that. Briefly, we talked about the cases of Karen Ann Quinlan and Nancy Cruzan, and those are cases worth knowing. They do sometimes pop up on exams, but they also um, tell us about the issues, the, the, these painful situations that families used to face and how our notion of the right to refuse life-sustaining treatment has, has evolved. And on this slide, I'm just putting some uh, references that you might find useful if you want to read about this some more. I can guarantee that you'll face these situations either in your clinical practice or occasionally with family members or family of friends where such issues uh, do arise. Thank you very much, and please feel free to contact me um, uh, if you would like uh, with, with any sorts of questions, and I'll be glad to get back to you.